Good morning. So as you have already heard, my name is Ananta Gawanga. Um, what you have not heard about me is that I am an alcoholic. To be fair to Ananta Gawanga, to be fair to me, is that I'm actually a recovering alcoholic. Um, the last time I had a drink was about eight years ago. Um, that also coincides with the day I stepped into the temple also. So um, today, if you don't know, our discourse is going to be about addiction. And um, we're going to look at addiction, and we're going to look at how to retrain your brain. Um, and so for me, I didn't wake up one morning and realize I was an addict. It was a slow process. It sort of it crept up on me. Um, till today, I still remember the day I took my first drink. And that was um, after I graduated from high school. And I was, I was 18 years old. And so I grew up in South Africa in a little surf community called Port Shepston. So um, all our lives, basically we went to school and then once school ends, you go onto the beach. That's, that's how I lived for 18 years of my life, basically. And so, so all my life, they drilled into your head, you have to study, you have to study, get your university, um, get your high school qualifications, then you can go to university. So after 18 years being indoctrinated like this, um, it was um, time for the results to come. And how you get your results in South Africa is that it's published in the paper. It's published in the national paper, not just any paper. So everybody gets to know. If they know your name and they know your surname, um, and if your name does not appear there, not only does your name appear, but whether you got an A, B, C, D, um, E, um, if it's an F, then it doesn't, it doesn't reflect. So also they know that. So everybody knows, and I grew up in a small surf town. Population of my town was 50,000. So everybody knows everybody, and TV is not enough to keep people entertained. So gossip is a very important aspect to a small town. So um, I was waiting, everybody was waiting, every um, high school kid was waiting at, um, this was some, um, I was 18 then. So I'm 36 now, so you can do the math on that. So the newspaper gets delivered at 1 a.m. Um, and so everybody waits, and then there's a rush to get the paper. And somehow or the other, I had passed. And I had, I had did OK enough to go to university. So a culmination of a life of studying and austerity, um, a few of my friends had a suggestion. We have to celebrate. right? And in South Africa, the best way to celebrate is champagne. Because right? arguably, we make the best wine, and we have the best bubbly. Right? So, and at South Africa, you can get alcohol at 24 hours, seven days a week. So in many senses, it's just like gold. Um, so that was when I had my first drink. And um, they said, no, just one glass of champagne. Who's it going to hurt? And I was thinking, who is it going to hurt? It's just one glass of champagne. And so that's when it started. And so at 18, I left home, um, had my own flat, going to university, um, studying law. And um, so to celebrate a long work week for a student, um, because you go to university at 8 o'clock, and you stop university at 8 or 1. Basically, you go to university, and that's all you do. That's what I did for one year at university. I just socialized with everybody. And then on Fridays, then everybody parties because there's no parents. Right? So then you're drinking on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And so I did that for about, for about a year. And then more than that, then there's, there's Wednesday also. So it started with Friday, Saturday, Sunday, then Wednesday because Wednesday is students' night. And on students' night, it's buy one, get one free. Right? Um, and then Thursday is tequila Thursday. So then it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and then Monday is the after party from the Sunday. And then Tuesday is ladies' night. So pretty much a whole week is covered. And so at that time, I didn't think I had a problem because everybody was doing this. This is just how we live. Um, and so it kind of 
slowly creeps up on you. Um, it's sort of like if you ever had an ex stalk you on Facebook, like you don't really know they're stalking you, but slowly it creeps up onto you. you know? So it was like that. Um, and then I was living such a life that I was waking up at the crack of noon. Right? So I was waking up sometimes at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and just repeating the cycle over and over again. Right? Um, and so this is why this topic is so dear to me, because I've experienced this firsthand. I've looked, I've been into the belly of the beast, and somehow or the other, um, I, got, I got out of there. So I can really appreciate and understand people that are going through addiction, because I've been there. Um, and the ironic part about this was at the time, I was an addiction counselor. So I understood theoretically everything about how addiction works, but still I was addicted. Um, and this is the power of addiction. So somehow or the other, I went from praying on a liver to living on a prayer. I went from thug life to hug life. And so this is what I'd like to share with everybody today. Um, I'm not saying that I'm pure, but what I can say is that I'm a little less dirty than I was previously. Um, and so like that, there's a saying that says, every saint has a past and every sinner a future. So for me, what this means is that it doesn't matter where you are now, but what matters is where you're going. Where's your gaze? What is your goal? So at one point, I was in the gutter of life, you can say. Um, but was it, what is important then and what is important now is where I was looking. And it says if that you aim for the stars, then even if you don't reach the stars, at least you'll get to the mountains. Yeah? So this is my goal for today, is to try to give hope um, and inspiration. And using myself as an example, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Yeah? Um, and one of the realizations that I would always also like to share with you today is that we all have strengths and weaknesses. And to acknowledge to ourselves and others that we are weak is a form of strength. Um, and that it's perfectly okay to not be okay. A lot of us are messed up, right? We're all suffering from some psychosis or some sort of anxiety, some sort of stress. Who here can say that their life is 100% perfect? Everything is just going well for you. So everybody is dealing with some sort of stress or the other. Right? So it's okay to not be okay. But it's not okay to not work on yourselves, to not get better. So this is what um, I'd like for us to share, to learn, to interact with each other for. So, We'll look at that, how we were free to make choices in life. But once you make the choice, then the choice controls the chooser. Um, and one other point, um, which is very much um, an, an essence of today's discourse, is that we are only as sick as our secrets. We cannot grow in recovery until we step out of our denial. So for so long, I suffered in silence thinking that I was the only one going through this. And I was using alcohol as a buffer for me to fit into society because I'm extremely introverted. And we live in a society where extroversion is encouraged. Um, it is the epitome of success. And so like that, in order to fit, because I was uncomfortable with who I am, I was using alcohol as a means just to fit into society. But Everybody is a snowflake. We are all individual parts and parcels of God, if you like. And it's okay to be different. Not every penny needs to fit the slot. And so in order to be comfortable with myself, first I had to realize, who am I? What makes me tick? Um, and that required going into myself, um, which is something we'll also look at today, introspection. Um, and so half your battle is won when, one, you acknowledge that you have a problem. You acknowledge that you have a problem, one, to yourself. You remove this denial out of your consciousness, 
out of your cognition. And two, acknowledge to others that, hey, I have a problem, I'm going through this. Right? Which is not an easy thing. I mean, for me to admit that I'm, I'm, I'm an alcoholic after not using for like eight years, as I was telling you this today, it was difficult for me also. And fundamentally, you're pretty much strangers, right? And it was difficult to say to strangers. Um, and it's difficult to say to strangers and to loved ones. I'm just like five minutes ago, I was feeling my heart pounding in my chest when I had to reveal again to everybody that, hey, I'm an alcoholic, I'm a, I'm a recovering alcoholic. So it's a difficult thing. Right? So this is one thing that you'll get from me in this class, is that I will always be honest with you. That's one thing I will give you. And whatever I do, I do it to the best of my ability. In the Bible, Jesus says that either be hot or cold. If you look warm, I'll spit you out. And that's how I live my life. When I was an alcoholic, I was the best alcoholic. Nobody could beat me. Right? Waking up early, having a beer, finishing off late with a straw rum. Straw rum's from Australia and has 80% alcohol. Right? Um, not that I'm advocating living like that. <laughs> what I'm advocating is do the opposite. Live with intensity. Live with desire. Live with passion. But not for those things that are going to degrade you and degrade your consciousness. Right? Uplift yourself. Right? Um, and this is some of my objectives that I would like to share one today. And fundamentally, I'll be sharing my heart with you today. And so if you want to judge me, that's cool. I'm okay with that. All my life I've been judged because I never, I was that puzzle piece that never fit the, the puzzle. I was a black sheep of the family, right? And I'm okay with that. Right? I have a tattoo on my neck, right? Where I come from, we have a term, it's called moxie. You need a lot of moxie to put a tattoo on your neck because of the social, social stigma attached to that. Right? Um, and so all my life I had people judge me without even knowing me, not even taking five seconds to get to know, hey, who is this dude? Right? So if you want to do that, then I'm okay with that. But one thing is that I will never judge you um, because I'm trying to live with empathy or rather I'll try not to judge anybody else until I walk a mile in their shoes. Um, and that's empathy. That's real compassion. Right? So some of our objectives that I'd like to achieve in today's discourse is that this course is for those suffering from addiction. It's also for those indirectly affected by addiction. Because if you are addicted to some behavior or substance or activity, it is affecting you, it's affecting your friends, it's affecting your family, it's affecting your dog and your cat. It's not just you um, that is affected by addiction. Right? So there's direct affection and direct um, suffering and indirect suffering for those loved ones connected to you. Um, to better understand the process of addiction. So we'll look at the neurological functionings of addiction based on neuropsychology but also Vedic psychology. We'll also look at Pavlovian behavioral psychology, as well as Freudian psychoanalysis. We'll also try to better understand ourselves. We spend so much time with ourselves, but we have no idea who we really are. And I'd like to create a healthy, non-judgmental atmosphere um, where we're free to open and discuss whatever we're going through. Um, in a non-judgmental, non-sectarian, um, loving and compassionate way. Right? So we can either do this as a group or individually, if you like, I'm here until after the, after the session also. Um, and we look at practical, lasting, long-term, organic, um, sustainable solutions to addictions and to other life stresses. Right? So this is what we'll look at in session one. Um, uh, and quick overview, brief overview of what's happening in session one, is that we'll directly look at what is an addiction. We're going to look at today's new drug. Um, we'll see how pornography has taken over as the, um, the new drug of modern society. By, by understanding addiction, we'll see how fundamentally the premise of all addictions flow in the same addiction cycle. By looking at pornography, we'll um, analyze the difference between love and lust. Um, we'll look proper into the addiction cycle, um, looking at 
behavioral psychology based on um, Pavlovian's um, dog experiment. Very famous experiment. I'm sure most of us know about it. So, if I had to ask a question, no right or wrong answers. If I had to ask a question, what does addiction mean to you? What, what would you say according to your definition? Sure. Even at the cost of that, all your relationships, Absolutely, like a habit. Uh huh. Anything beyond a certain limit that you see, and you're still doing it at the cost of that. Sure. Absolutely. Oh, a habit that's causing pain to yourself and to to loved ones around you. Would anybody like to add to that definition of addiction? Something that you can't control with your own will, like it's forcing you to act even though you want to stop, but I just cannot. Right? right? Anything else? So you would like, you wanted to add something? No, I was going to say compulsive behavior. Compulsive, exactly, compulsive behavior. This is a definition of addiction, um, which is pretty much everything that you'll have said. Addiction is a psychological and physical inability to stop consuming a chemical or drug, activity or substance, even though it is causing psychological and physical harm. Right? So most of us are aware that uh, addiction is very much associated with, um, with chemical or substance abuse. But also a very important aspect to a very broad definition of addiction, um, which the DSM and psychological manuals today are inculcating in the definition, broad definition of addiction, is also lifestyle behaviors and activities, right? Um, for example, the use of technology and smartphones and other technological devices, right? So I'm not advocating taking your smartphone and throwing it into the deep blue sea, right? But what I'm saying is use it in a healthy way, right? So um, we look at this internal struggle, um, this, this battle within the mind of demons that nobody really can see, but that we can perceive through this internal war that we wage within our mind. So when I think of addiction, um, it's also an unhealthy removal of stresses that we are feeling in life. So I want you to remember this, an unhealthy removal or so-called removal of some stress, anxiety, pain that we are feeling in our lives. And addiction reminds me of this. Um, I'm sure everybody knows that's a picture of Hitler, right? And who was Hitler? A dictator, right? All of what you said is correct. Huh? He was a very powerful dictator, right? Um, and so addiction is like this. Addiction is like a dictator dictating to you, controlling you with an iron fist ruling over the choices you make, forcing you to ha act in a way, um, in a habituated, controlled, almost like a juggernaut. Do you know what a juggernaut is? Maybe you've seen the juggernaut in, in X-Men movies. Right? A juggernaut is an unstoppable force that once the wheels have set in motion, it's almost impossible to stop the juggernaut. Right? So an addiction is like this forcing us to act in compulsive ways, crazy, craving an unstoppable force that even though we want to stop, we are helpless to the yearnings and desires of our addictions. Right? Um, so I'd like to make a very important point and that what I'm about to say may not make sense initially. It's that, see, our addiction is not our problem. Right? The addiction that we are afflicted by is not our problem. What, our, what the real, the main problem is, is our focus. Right? Your addiction is not the problem. The problem, the real problem is your focus. Right? So one overcomes the addiction not by focusing on the problem, but focusing on the, on the solution. Right? This is how you overcome your addiction. All too often we focus on the problem. Right? And when you focus on the problem, what happens? That problem multiplies, it's magnified, and in your mind, 
it becomes bigger than what it is in reality. And in psychology, we call this a cognitive dissonance, that the problem within your head does not truly reflect the reality of the external environment. So we blow this problem up in scale and magnitude. So the problem of addiction is not the real problem. The problem is our focus. And when we focus on solutions, long-lasting, eternal solutions, then we are able to cut at the root of addiction. Just at that, at the root. Um, make sense? So what I'd like to focus in the next series of slides is that how not all addictions revolve about taking an alcohol or taking a needle and sticking it into your vein. Not all are about external substances you put into your body. A lot of our addictions are caused by a repetitive behavior, a lifestyle choice or decision. Right? And what's interesting is that the way these lifestyle choices or activities function. For example, we'll be looking at pornography going forward. Um, and we'll see that the same chemical reaction takes place in the cytoplasm of the brain when you inject a needle into your vein or take alcohol as the same dose of um, the, the high you get when you look at pornography. And it increases over time. Um, and so what happens is that there's a chemical poisoning within the brain that oxytocin, um, cytosine, um, new chemicals like dopamine are released within the cytoplasm of the brain. And what happens is that in a normal functioning interaction that's organic and healthy, for example, running, these chemicals are released to give you a natural high, a runner's high, we call it. But when we abuse pornography, what happens is that the brain becomes flooded by these chemicals, and you're actually poisoning the cytoplasm of the brain. And we'll look at how neurons that fire together, wire together, and create a neural pathway. Um, and in Vedic psychology, we call this a vasana or samskara. Um, and basically, it's a repetitive activity. Basically, in neuropsychology, we will call this the addictive cycle, the neural pathway that we are forming. Right? So there's actually no disconnect between science and spirituality. Right? Um, Einstein said, sorry, Newton said, the more I study material science, the more I believe in God. Right? Because it's, we won't get into that subject matter. So this word gets thrown around all the time, right? Love, yes? Thrown around all the time. What does love mean? What is love to you? If I had to ask you, so what is love? What does love mean to you? Not an easy question, is it? Yeah? Would you like to have a stab at it? I think that would be the essence of what love is. You know? Unconditional. It, it's pure. It doesn't necess necessarily require reciprocation. You know? And the strongest connection of love we have in the material world is the relationship of the mother for her child, a real mother. It said that a mother's happiness or joy is the height it will reach, or its equivalence is related to her saddest child. That's the height that her happiness will reach. Right? Because it's the closest relationship that you have with God, is the relationship that the mother and child has. That's why that bond is so strong, right? because it's selfless. That the mother will do anything for the child. Right? And so the nature of love is to give without asking anything in return. Right? It's, it's genuine, it's loyal, it's beautiful. And um, the Bhagavad Gita explains in chapter 12, um, Krishna says that I am sex life in accordance to religion. And this is how love is expressed in its topmost expression in the material world. It's the coming together of man and woman, not to exploit each other's bodies, but as a reciprocation to a loving relationship based on honesty and trust and respect um, and mutual reciprocation. This is genuine. It's not exploitation, right? Um, so it's a beautiful thing. But if you look at lust, lust is the opposite of love. The nature of lust is it works like a virus. If you ever notice the nature of a virus, 
It goes into any resource. It goes into there and it starts taking. Without thought of how it's damaging its other surrounding, it takes in an unsustainable way. It rapes and pillages the resources until everything is used up and then it goes to the next resource where it will do the same thing over and over and over again. And that is the nature of lust. And that is the nature of pornography. It is selfish. It is cheap. It is unnatural. It is demeaning to the person that's watching pornography and it's demeaning to the people that are acting in, in the pornograph uh, pornographic scenes. Right? So at no way is it uplifting and it's also fake. Right? So it's it synthesized love, but in a very reflective and perverted way. Right? Um, so it's like the difference of having a very organic and healthy meal as opposed to fast food. Right? So which is better for you, McDonald's or say having a meal at Sarai? But which tastes better? See, according to your consciousness, according to your consciousness will define which tastes better for you. If you have a more sattvic, a more mode of goodness, a more divine consciousness, then Siraya will taste better to you. Because it's sattvic, it's, it's organic, it's, uh, it's pure. But McDonald's is easier, and we're all about instant sense gratification. I need to be entertained quickly. Press a few buttons, entertainment is there. Um, fast food, drive to McDonald's, quickly it comes. You know? um, Swiggy, I just make a phone call, quickly it comes. Whereas nobody has time to roll chapatis. Now there's chapati machines also. You know? Microwave dinners, press a few buttons, three minutes, done. And how do we eat? We sit in front of a TV, like that. You know? So like that, that's not good for us, but we attach to that because of our cognition because of our samskaras, because of our addiction to just instant sense gratification, right? So which is something we'll try to retrain, to rewire today, right? Not that I'm saying, not that I'm against that, right? Not that I'm saying don't do that. Maybe I am saying don't do that. Um, but actually the choice is yours. Right? So this is the problem with pornography, is that one, it's a drug. It functions as the same way as hardcore no narcotics. And what happens is that once dopamine, oxytocin, and serotonin are released within the body, um, when it's flooding the body, which is what we'll look at in a little later, it causes us, it forces us to act in certain ways, even against our will. So oxytocin is a binding chemical. Oxytocin is released when a man and woman come together. And it is that binding chemical that forces, forges a very close bond between the husband and wife. Right? And what happens is that when you engage in pornography, then that close bond is between you and your phone. Right? Um, so it's not between you and another human being. So that's one danger of pornography. Um, the other thing is when dopamine and serotonin are released and then starts flooding the brain, it, it causes dependence and it also causes for the synapses within the brain to get dull. So like with alcohol, you should give you the same buzz, to give you the same high. The same thing with pornography. You get desensitized. So you require more and more and more to, to get you to the same buzz, basically. Right? So that's the danger of that. And when you flood your body with this what are natural substances, but in an unnatural way, it, would be, it would leads to uncalled, uncontrolled aggression, a lack of ability to control yourself, a lack of ability to focus, uh, insomnia. Um, so many things are there. We won't get into that because that's easily researched on the internet. Um, but what, I, what um, I learned studying neuropsychology is something that the industry and media doesn't teach you is that how long pornography has been in our society. Right? Can anybody say how long has um, nude images, nude pictures of men and women being in human society? Thousands of years, all right? Um, before, sorry. Exactly. 
on, on cave pictures and drawings. Quite rudimentary, but still there. Right? Um, uh, just before I get into that subject matter, is that um, one reason why we can't or we won't get rid of pornography in our society is because sex sells. And so advertising media and moguls who run the world don't think your politicians are running the world. They run the world because it's an information age. You control the masses by a media, right? Um, so like that, if you, this is how you control a large society. Alcohol and cheap entertainment. And like that, you can get the masses to do whatever you want. Right? Um, and so they've realized that, that sex sells. Um, this is an advertisement uh, for in 1871 for the Pearl Tobacco Company that used this image to sell their product. Pearl Co Tobacco Company was on the verge of bankruptcy. And one of their um, media executives thought that let's use this on the cover of our advertising and on the back of our tobacco box. And so if you look at this, it's a man and woman embracing each other. And what it says to society is that it's associating themselves with success, with intimacy. That if you smoke this hair, the man is going to want you. If you smoke this, the woman's going to want you. You're cool, right? And who, wasn't, who doesn't want to be cool, right? And so like that, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Dame, James Dean. He was like the king of cool, and maybe I think it was like, like the 30s and the 40s, or maybe the 50s. And one of the most iconic photos of James Dean was with him but a cigarette on, on the edge of his lip. And everybody, if you're male, you wanted to be like him. If you're female, you wanted to be with him. Right? So he was the sex symbol of that era. And so that's what it symbolized. Right? He was, they weren't just selling cigarettes. They were selling a status symbol. And we'll see how we take the message that society is giving from the sense object is internalized through the senses into the mind, and this is how it permeates and affects our consciousness. Right? So they understood sex cells. They understood every time you look at that, you're getting shots of dopamine, of serotonin, um, of adrenaline, and it's drawing you, one, to look at it more, and two, to want to associate this with success. And in material life, I would say the epitome of success is if you're, now this is a generalization, it's a stereotype, right? Um, and if you don't agree, that's cool also. And if you're gonna beat me up later, that's cool also, right? The, the stereotype is that for a man, he wants a very beautiful lady, right? Um, like a trophy that he can walk next to, right? But a lady, not so much, the looks are not so important for a lady, generalization. But a nice Louis Vuitton handbag would be nice on her arm also, right? So she would like a, a rich husband, right? So both these people generally are looking for these sort of things, right? Which is what is sold in these sort of advertisements, right? Um, so this is how, this is why it'll be very difficult to get rid of pornography, um, because it sells. Um, and it is a billion dollar industry. Um, in 2016, pornography only in the USA made four times more money than NFL, um, so that's American football, gridiron, basketball, baseball, and hockey combined. Four times more. It's a billion dollar industry. Who can stop that? It's a juggernaut. Right? So, ma'am, as you're saying, nude pictures is not something new to society. Archaeologists have been digging this up for thousands of years. Um, in the tombs of the pharaohs, they've, they've found a little more explicit paintings and drawings than, than this one. Right? Um, so you could say from the time humans were civilized that this was around. Right? Um, so the next point I was going to make that it evolves but into something more ghastly. What happened was in 1948, um, Dr. Alfred Kingsley he published an article advocating um, that all forms of sexual practices should be normalized and that people should pursue sexual desires no matter how young or how old they are. And so this is a very dangerous thing because it leads to uncontrolled um, exploitation. Um, it can lead to abuse of, of women and children. It, it, it's a very dangerous thing. 
And so when that article was published, um, you Hefner picked up on this. And you Hefner published one of the first pornographic magazines that was socially acceptable. And so it was socially acceptable because he was somewhat of a genius. What he did was that he linked his pornographic images with the elite of mental cognition at the time. So the greatest of um, the 50s and 60s economists, the greatest authors, the greatest writers, the greatest psychologists, um, the greatest capital of, capitalists of the time. And he got them to write articles. And so next to his articles were pornographic images. And so they normalized it. Because why? Because the intellectual branch of society was advocating or promoting it. So it's okay. So that's how he sold it into society. But still, there was, it was still somewhat tame. Right? Um, then it evolved into the DVD and the um, VHS age. When the 70s and 80s, um, you could go to like blockbusters and, and other um, vending video sites. Um, but still, it was somewhat, means if you're a little shy, you wouldn't go there and ask, hey, I want this movie, you know? Or it was also in like a dark section where it was somewhat taboo to go into it. Right? Um, so it was still somewhat restricted. But what's happened today in the information age is all hell has broken loose. And what is happening today is It's easy access. Now, see, I'm not saying that technology is bad or is it good, right? But is a knife bad or is it good? According to how you use the knife, then it's bad or it's good. A surgeon uses the scalpel to save a life. A thug will use a knife to kill you, right? So we can use technology to uplift ourselves or we can use it to degrade ourselves. And today, it's just a few clicks away, right? So it is in the... All hell broke loose when the internet um, came to the fore. And now it's, it's just not even in the privacy of your own room. With, with, with this, you can go to a playground. You can go to a bathroom. Um, when I came here from South Africa, there was a man in the plane that he was watching pornography, but he didn't realize that his headphone wasn't connected. So he had it in the jack, but the jack wasn't in. And he was putting it louder and louder, and he's wondering, why can't I hear anything? Why is it? Then he realized, oh my God, everybody else can hear. You know? So then quickly he put it, he put it on pause. Right? So this is when all hell broke loose, is the advent of the internet. Right? So some facts, the naked truth about pornography. 75% right? of porn stars are using drugs to deal with emotional and physical pain. Um, they're coming with psychosis, they're coming with trauma, and once they're going into the porn industry, it's becoming worse. Or they are getting abused emotionally and physically within the industry. So there's also a high correlation between suicide and, and porn stars. Right? Um, so it's glamorized, but it's a lot of suffering, actually. Um, FBI stats. Porn was found in 80% of violent sex crimes or in the house of pup, on the, in the ho homes um, of the perpetrators, right? So the perps had this either with them um, wherever they were when they were torturing their victims, um, or on one of the devices that belonged to them. So that's a high stat. Eighty percent is huge, right? and um, this is a stat from 2016, so it's a little dated. Um, Fifty-six percent of all divorces in the United States have at least one partner having obsession with a pornographic website. Right? Um, so at this point of our discourse, um, what we're going to do is look at a, at a short video that's going to explain the addiction cycle. If you understand the addiction cycle, you will understand fundamentally the essence of how most addiction works. All addiction or most addiction works on this basic premise. So um, an addiction cycle, in Vedic psychology, it's a samskara. Um, behavioral psychology, it's classical conditioning. So fundamentally the same premise. And we'll sort of break it down and analyze it 
um, according to a different paradigms. So the, the addiction cycle, right? So we'll briefly um, visit the addiction cycle. So it begins or it starts with a trigger, right? So what is a trigger? Um, when you think of trigger, generally I think, because I'm South African, um, that thing you pull on a gun, right? Um, that is a trigger. So it, it, when you pull a trigger, it's a catalyst that sets the bullet, bullet off in the chamber, right? So similarly, there are various triggers within our life, right? So for different people, the trigger may be different things. Um, generally, it's a stressor, right? Um, generally, it's some sort of stressful or painful activity within your life, right? So who here suffers from stress? Who is not suffering from stress? Nobody suffering from stress. Okay. Um, it said that two people don't suffer from stress. Somebody who is self-realized means that they are such an advanced spiritualist that they understand that they're not this body, they're the soul. And the other person is somebody who is clinically insane. These two people don't suffer from stress. Right? Um, so could somebody give me an example of something that stresses you out in life? So can you give me an example of something that stresses you out? Uh, someone working in the restaurant and there's maybe too many orders at once. Too many orders coming in at once, right? It's crazy, damn people. Deadlines, very important. Yeah. Anything else? Family, absolutely, right? And especially in an Indian family, right? <clears throat> just the intensity and pace of life, right? Um, uh, and these things are, are, for some people, it becomes a trigger, right? It becomes a catalyst that leads to an addictive um, behavior. Um, sometimes the trigger can be mere boredom. It means we have too much of time on our hands, right? Um, and so an addiction is a, is a way to unhealthily deal with stress or a way to reveal, relieve stress, or relieve boredom, but in a behavior that will give you some sort of temporary relief, but long-term pain. So it's like this. Say if you're feeling very cold, right? And I give you 50,000 rupees, right? Now, what are some ways that you can keep yourself warm with 50,000 rupees? Buy a sweater. What else? Nobody else can say besides buy a sweater. Say again. Give me one way. Buy what? Absolutely. You can go to Goa. Right? right? You can also take that money and burn it. Will that make you warm? But it will make you warm, right? So this is what it is to use an addiction um, to sort of make you warm, right? So it gives you some release, some relief from the cold, but it's nonsensical in the long term. Right? Make sense? Right? So. This is the start of the addiction cycle, right? Um, the trigger. For different people, it's different things. Right? Um, so the next phase is rationalization. Right? So, <clears throat> so phase one, the stressor has come into my life. Phase two, um, or step two of the addiction cycle, is I rationalize this. Like, there's an example. I'm creating false but plausible excuses to justify unacceptable behavior. So the mind can justify anything. Hitler justified killing six million Jews because he called them subhuman. He said that it was better for the German economy. Right? His mind justified doing that. Right? Um, or example of students. Students watch TV instead of studying, saying that additional studying won't do any good anyhow. Or what I'm studying um, is connected to this television program. Um, I'm studying to be an engineer, 
and IPL is on, and it's conservation of energy, um, and it's also Newton's second law of motion. Every action has an opposite equal reaction because Donny is hitting the ball on the um, the, the cricket bats with the ball, and there you go, Newton's second law of motion. So the mind can justify not not studying by doing some random thing, right? So this aspect of the addiction cycle is called rationalization, where you rationalize your behavior. You make it acceptable to yourself within your mind. Right? Um, so for one who is addicted to alcohol, for example, like when I would try to stop drinking, then after a few weeks or so, I'd go into a bar. And I'd be like, but the rugby is on. And for a South African, there's nothing more important than rugby. And so you go into the bar and just, I'm just going to watch the game. Right? And then halfway through, then suddenly you're drinking again. But I went there with the intention of just to watch the rugby. But really, I was cheating myself because I rationalized going into the bar. Right? Or I'll just hang out with my friends, and they're all drinking. I won't drink because I can control this. I'm strong. I'm bigger than my addiction. And what do you end up doing? You end up drinking? Um, or say, for example, addicted to pornography. I will just use my phone to search something on the internet for my project. Then I go into YouTube, again for my project. Then one link to another link. Then suddenly, I'm on Pornhub. Right? So like that, you rationalize what you're doing um, by saying, I'm in control. I'm not hurting anybody. Um, it's, it's not going to hurt me. Right? So that's rationalization. The next phase in the addiction cycle, so trigger uh, or the anxiety, then rationalization, then the ritual begins, right? The ritual begins. Now, when you think of ritual, what comes to mind when you think of ritual? From a traditional sense, if you think of ritual, what, what comes to mind? A pattern of behavior, right? Very important, the sequence of events that repeat themselves. Like, I, I used to love meditating in Catholic churches. Still, I love meditating in Catholic churches. And so I would go there, and sometimes I'd spend all day. And so you get to see the life in a Catholic church. And so they have various rituals. And at a set time, the priest would come with like, like this incense that he will wave around in, in like a canister. I don't even know what they call it. No? And as people come in, they, there's a ritual they perform that you, you come in, you bow down to the cross, you um, make, I, I, I don't even know what you call that, but I was just really amazed by it. Um, sign of the cross, right? Um, and then they, they kneel down before the altar. Um, so there's a ritual that is performed, and it's very beautiful. Um, um, and so like that, there's a ritual also to our addiction, a series of actions and events and if you pay close attention to it, you'll know your ritual for your addiction. Right? Um, and so the ritual results in taking more aggressive steps in order for you to use. You haven't used yet, but for example, somebody addicted to pornography, they'll wake up at 2 o'clock, um, pick up their phone at 2 o'clock. They know every 2 o'clock in the AM. They understand that nobody is awake. Then, again, rationalize it. I'm just looking at YouTube, I'm just doing research, and then as the ritual starts to begin, small traces of dopamine and oxytocin are slowly released into the brain, and it's increasing the level of the heart rate. Um, it's causing you, it's moving you into the direction of using. Right? Um, the ritual begins. After the ritual, after the ritual cycle, you start using. Here, resistance seems almost futile, that you, you log on to the website you're not meant to be on, and then you start watching, or you have that first drink. The first drink is leading to the second, to the third. Well, I started, I may as well go into it. Right? Um, and so the trigger has led to um, rationalization, led to the ritual. Now I'm, I'm, I've come to using. Right? And then from there, you experience the, the harmful effects, 
um, of, of the drug of your choice, right? So I had a slide with, um, it's a meme, and he's holding up a glass of beer. And so the, the top says, <clears throat> it's, it's his friend drinking, basically, right? Him and his friend are drinking. Right? And so the, the top says, I pointed to two old drunks sitting across the bar from us and told my friend. So two people sitting at the bar, and so the one friend is pointing to the other friend, right? So they're both intoxicated. He's saying, I pointed to the two old drunks sitting across the bar from us, and I told my friend. That's us in 10 years, right? So he's pointing. And his friend says, you idiot, that's a mugger. Right? So we start experiencing the harmful effects of our addiction, right? So for alcohol, then, you're covered over by, um, by your addiction, and you don't see fundamentally the world as it is, right? With your beer goggles, you can get into lots of trouble, right? Um, so that's where we think our problems are the solutions to our problems, but in actuality, they're creating more problems for us, right? um, And that, in a nutshell, very briefly, is the addiction cycle. Or in neuropsychology, we'll call it the neural pathway, where neurons that are wiring together, um, sorry, neurons that are firing together, wire together. And as they fire and wire, they're releasing um, oxytocin, which is a, um, see, dopamine is a pleasure-giving chemical. So the more dopamine that is released, the more you want to do an activity. Oxytocin is a bonding chemical that it causes you Whenever that chemical is released, whatever activity you're doing, it causes attachment for that activity. So a very dangerous com combination if you're doing something wrong. Right? Um, and the more you repeat the cycle, the more it becomes ingrained and the more you become habituated. It's like, how many people can drive uh, a manual car? So when you're driving a manual car, uh, initially when you first started, when you first started learning how to drive, was it easy or difficult? For me, it was terribly difficult because I was always grinding gears, um, looking. Sometimes I put it in reverse, look forward and go backwards, right? So, but the more you practice, the more that some scar gets set in place, the more the mental impression, the more the, me the neural pathway is set. So it forms a habit, right? So now I don't have to look down to change like that. I just know, clutch in, change. I can. I drive, I, can, I shouldn't talk on the phone while I'm driving, but I can do that. Um, so it becomes second nature almost. You become conditioned uh, in a certain way because your neural pathway has wired in that way. And this, is, oh, and this is what's happening with the neural pathway, with the addiction cycle. Right? Um, and so, so I'll give a very basic example of the whole addiction cycle. Um, I have... Um, a trigger, um, so stress has come because too many people at the restaurant, right? Um, I just can't handle all the orders that are coming in. So, um, so the stress has come, then I'll try to rationalize wanting to use. I'm not hurting anybody, who's it going to harm? After the rationalization process, what's the third thing that happens? The ritual starts to begin, right? Um, maybe I'll take my phone, lock the door, go into the toilet. But I'm only going to look at YouTube, right? Nothing that is anything related to pornography. And then after ritual is, but then you start to use, right? And then finally, um, you use, and again, it leads to sort of guilt and um, sadness and um, depression and so many things are associated to that, right? And then the, the, the cycle repeats itself if it's not broken, right? So it's a vicious cycle, basically. So we are free up until the point of choice. Right? So you're free up until the point of choice. Then the choice controls the chooser. So you're free up until the point of choice, then the choice controls the chooser. Right? Which fundamentally brings us to the end of the first section of um, addiction and how to retrain the brain. Um, I have a slide which is for um, some of the takeaways from the first session, which I call insightful insight. Um, some of the main points. One of them is to acknowledge that we have a weakness is a strength. Right? Um, to acknowledge that we have a weakness is a strength. 
Um, this way, to acknowledge that I have a weakness to myself and to others um, negates us from denial. Denial and repression is to repress my, my problem or, or not give them existence when in reality they are afflicting them. So to acknowledge my weakness to myself and to others is a strength and actually a tool to help you come out of addiction. It's okay to not be okay because society paints this perfect picture um, of just having this amazing life. Um, and it's okay not to fit the paradigm of what society defines as what perfection is. Right? So we all messed up. And this is what makes us beautiful. Right? Because this is what makes life a rainbow. I, I mean, if we were all just black and white, how dull will society be? But because you are, ne because you are unique, because you are the spice of life, this is what makes life interesting. So Shakespeare said, to thy own self be true. So, to thy own self be true. Right? Why live according to expectations of what other people have for you? Right? So it's okay to not be okay, but what's not okay is to not work on getting better. Right? Um, you're free to choose, but once you make the choice, then the choice chooses your options for you then the choice controls the chooser. You're only as sick as your secret, and the problem is not your problem. What is your problem? Your focus. When you focus on solutions, then your problems, one, become solved and become minimized. And um, that brings us to the end of our first session of addiction.